This is Goatsucker Harvest and I'm reading from chapter 4. It's called Offers and Opportunities. Sit down, Emma, do, and tell Thursa what a blessing has come her way. Kezzy plumped up a cushion. You make a better doer than a winder, muttered Thomas, retreating for sanctuary to the windmill again. Kezzy saw her daughter's character, but believed the best of all her children. If she thought about it too much, she'd worry, as she did about everything in life. Emma glanced round her mother's immaculate parlour, yet still wore the expression of somebody who has narrowly avoided stepping in some unthinkable substance left in the road by passing cattle on their way to slaughter. Thursa could see Grace smirking to herself as she pummeled current studded dough at the kitchen table. Emma was an exacting visitor, but a source of comedy to the servants with her shrill air of superiority. Thursa had heard Grace mimicking a voice like Emma's to Francis, the two servants howling at the blistering accuracy of Grace's portrayal. Now she knew who the butt of their hilarity was, she fought back her own chuckles. I can't stay, mother, Emma breezed on. Darnell will be driving the carriage back from Jam Hall. I don't know when, but terribly soon. He wouldn't want to keep me standing around here all at a loose end. Tell Thursa what good news you told me. I can tell her properly when she visits us tomorrow. Do make sure she has on her stout shoes for the walk back, mother, as I'm not quite certain that Darnell will have time for fetching and carrying all our relatives back and forth and back and forth from goodness knows where at all hours of the day and night. Thursa tried to feel thrilled by the warmth of the invitation. You know how very busy my Darnell is with his business, Emma continued without a pause. Business in town, business with solicitors, business at Full Jam Hall, business here, business there. Squire Charlesworth and his aunt, Lady Laura, so depend on my Darnell in his capacity as bailiff for supervising the common labourers. The squire can't trust anybody else. Oh, and those tenants. At least, I think that's what Darnell and Squire Charlesworth said in front of an MP friend of his, in Darnell's hearing only last week. Oh, or some week, I don't quite remember. You wouldn't expect me to carry all those little details in my head. Thursa was glad Aunt Emma seemed un incapable of pausing for breath. It saved her own opinions coming under her aunt's scrutiny and being found hopelessly, dramatically wanting. When should I send her over to you? asked Kezzy when Fem Emma finally missed a beat. Send her? Oh my goodness, mother, no! Really? Darnell will have sorted out all those trifling details by then. She must just be ready tomorrow and Darnell will call in the trap and scoot her across to Cardike House. Did you ever taste coconut cake, Thurs Teresa? Thurza winced. How could she start her contribution to Emma's monologue with a truculent, <clears throat> that isn't my name? Had her aunt forgotten? She looked at Kezzy for guidance, reluctant to offend and even less keen to visit her aunt and the uncle she could scarcely remember meeting, so pressing did his business always seem to be. We did carry a coconut on thistle once, Thursa offered. It had fallen from a cargo ship from the Indies, and Sam found it by the capstan. Judd bowled it down the de ne deck, so it smashed inside the forecastle. Oh dear, oh dear, em Emma found her face and rolled her eyes. I hear a foreign tongue babbling. My head quite swims. We can do better than all that bag beggarly trash collecting. I should hope so. Coconut is a cake, Teresa baked by a cook from Switzerland, one that Lady Laura had spare and was gracious enough to recommend to Darnell after an unfortunate incident with our own maid. Coconut madeleine. It melts on the tongue like a snowflake. Thursa will be ready and waiting, I'll see to that. 
Kezzy saw Furza's eyes were beginning to glaze and nudged her to indicate Emma was about to bid farewell. Listen for the trap, mind. My Darnell is a busy man. Emma leaned down, though she was no taller than Furza. Furza re-emerged from her trance to find her aunt was offering her face to be kissed. Emma tapped her cheek impatiently just by the, her bonnet ribbon. Furza planted a genuine kiss but just as her arms opened to embrace her mother's little sister, Emma's shoulders rose and she snapped her spine back into a ramrod of upright propriety. Thursa let her hands fall to her sides and blushed at her own clumsiness in reading these unfamiliar signs of breeding and etiquette. She made herself a mental note that her aunt was very unlike her comical, easy-going sister Dinah and was evidently setting her own bewildering compendium of social rules. She wondered what the wonderful news was that awaited her at the Salkeld's home, but knew better now than to try and squeeze a word in edgeways. They watched Emma from Mill Cottage, teetering along the village street, scarcely dressed for the icy pinch still in the air, carrying a dimply parasol that wouldn't have kept its delicate frame in one piece had the wind from the marshes given it more than a playful tug. Emma picked her way between the cart ruts with shoes that looked far from the stout one she'd recommended for her niece's visit the following day. Kezzy went back inside, and Furza heard her telling Grace pointedly, Put the best china away again, Grace, and fetch the shears through to me.